Welcome to our last webinar in the Intelligence Workstation series. My name is Richard Ibarra, and I'm on the national government team here at Esri. Your presenters today are Wendy Creighton, Kyle Talbot, and Kurt Schwopey. In today's webinar, we will explore imagery tools for intelligence production. <coughs> if you'd like to download and follow along with the slides, please see the handout section in the right-hand side of your screen. You may ask questions at any time through the questions box located on the right-hand side, and we'll provide answers during the Q&A section at the end of the webinar. There will also be survey questions when you exit, and we ask that you please take a moment to complete the questions so that we, be, we may continue to present on topics that are useful to you. This webinar is being recorded and will be posted on the same page you registered from. I now turn over the webinar to Wendy. Thanks, Richard. Intelligence analysts need a workstation environment that supports their workflows and complex intelligence requirements. In this final web webinar of the Intelligence Workstation series, we are going to GIS provides applications and tools that leverage enterprise geospatial services and community imagery formats in a collaborative production environment. Imagery tools such as the ArcGIS Pro extension, image analyst extension deliver an integrated workstation capability for visualizing, exploiting, and managing imagery with your spatial data and within a single workstation environment. My name is Wendy Creighton. I'm an intelligence specialist here at Esri. I have 20 years experience working with defense and intelligence organizations, focusing on security and intelligence operations. Kurt and Kyle, would you like to introduce yourselves? Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Kurt Schwopey. I got my geospatial start as a topographic engineer about 30 years ago uh, during Desert Storm. I led the effort to use 10-cap satellite and U2 imagery to map obstacles, perform train analysis, and plan supply routes. After leaving the Army, I worked a number of different imagery intelligence programs to include designing the first all-digital target materials workstation system. Following September 11th, I was asked to join a special intel targeting team integrating MAZINT, SIGINT, and imagery into a variety of specialized information and operational products. I joined ESRI back in 2011 and have since worked to develop our imagery solutions across various federal programs. Morning, everyone. My name is Kyle Talbot. I'm a solution engineer. I have three years at ESRI working with our uh, intelligence customers. <coughs> I have a background in geospatial intelligence and specifically work with uh, our imagery products and helping integrate those at our at our Intel customer sites. Thanks, guys. The global challenges that we face today are more complex than ever before. A vast number of issues may not lie completely within a single nation state and they don't necessarily fit neatly into traditional military or diplomatic roles. To respond, our systems and workflows need to be dynamic, agile, and easy to use. There is also an explosion of new sources of information from drones, consumer devices, social media, and real-time reporting sensors. The volume of data and sources is growing exponentially, and from it, critical decisions need to be made quickly to ensure mission success. All of this leads to increased demand for applications and tools that integrate data from multiple sensors, streamline intelligence workflows, and enable modern intelligence production and sharing. ArcGIS is a platform for intelligence. It is designed to ingest and display data from multiple types of sensors, to include national, theater, and tactical level sensors and sources. Analysts leverage various integrated tools to reveal patterns and relationships within and across multiple intelligence disciplines, and can apply existing workflows and tradecraft to create intelligence products. ArcGIS truly integrates people, technology, and processes to support multiple missions. Throughout this webinar series, you may hear us refer to the Intelligence Workstation. The Intelligence Workstation with ArcGIS is a combination of applications and tools leveraging the ArcGIS platform. It is scalable to your organization, mission, 
and intelligence requirements, leverages enterprise data and services, and is built on the foundation of ArcGIS Pro as the modern desktop application. With specialized intelligence configuration for ArcGIS Pro, the intelligence workstation is designed for analysts. It's enhanced by defense solutions apps and tools and integrates imagery tools with geospatial capabilities, all in a single workstation environment. To further explore these imagery tools and capabilities, I'm going to turn it over to Kurt. Well, being the old timer of the group, I've had the privilege of working on both the mapping and the intelligence side of things. And frankly, I really love the science aware, simply because it's not just about GIS. Even with imagery, all the work you do is about location, finding things, and working with the imagery to extract features that you can use for analysis and intelligence purposes. Just to reinforce a, a little bit about what Wendy was talking about, is if you took a, take a look at the different intelligence activities that you have across the community, you see how the science aware acts as that fundamental foundation for integrating all those information into a single source of, of different products that can be distributed across an enterprise, an organization, to executives, to commanders, and to mobile operators, so they can make quick and timely decisions to support ongoing operations. And imagery is a key part of that. And so let's dig a little bit deeper now on how that imagery can go in and do that type of exploitation to provide that support to these organizations. It does start with a framework. And the framework is one and the same between GIS and with imagery. It's important to recognize the three key components that make up the ArcGIS platform in the framework of geospatial in information. It starts with a system of record. The system of record is your authoritative data. These are your sources that you rely on and you trust. You take those systems of records, that information, and you bring it into a system of insight. And at this point, you can do your analysis. You can do your work to discover the things that you're looking for and identifying the key information that you need to support ongoing operations. And of course, it doesn't do you any good to leave that information on your own computer. You have to disseminate that across the board, across multiple organizations. So you have to have a, a working system of engagement. The way we overlay this on top of, of imagery and what we do with imagery is your system of record is all about imagery management, working with massive volumes of, of imagery and libraries and archives in real time as it comes in from the sensor. Your system of insight is all your imagery analysis, your heavy duty analytics, and that is getting more and more powerful as I'll show through the presentation. And then finally, imagery services. This is the ability to access imagery products, intelligence products via web solutions on any device anywhere. So if you take a look at the ArcGIS platform, you'll see that imagery is a key and vital part that overlays directly on top of the complete structure that we've put together. At the bottom, you have imagery services. These come from your imagery libraries. That feeds up into what can be a cloud-based structure or uh, a file system, however your organization is set up to work. And from that information, you can do a variety of different things from creating foundation data with your ortho mapping capabilities and your derived products from your imagery analytics capabilities. And of course, you can use a variety of different clients to go ahead and exploit that data. But the two clients that we focus on now for imagery exploitation within ArcGIS is ArcGIS Pro and our new web clients. And we're gonna present both of those as we go through the presentation. And of course, it doesn't do you any good if you can't bring imagery into the system. And this is one area where I think Esri has, has really excelled. 
we can bring in just about any type of raster and point cloud data that you need to work with as an analyst. This includes straight up imagery from multiple satellite aerial and drones. We can also bring in full motion video and work with the full motion video data, which we're gonna show you. We can actually work with point clouds and do feature extraction from point clouds and LIDAR systems like you'll find on the, the Buckeye program. So a key part of obviously being in imagery solution is being able to get that data in. And of course, for the US and our close allies, uh, one of the key sources of information is built around the NITF, the National Imagery and Transmission Format. With ArcGIS, we are fully certified to NITF 2.1 standards up to level seven. We also support the, the NATO standard, uh, NSIF, and we can clearly support any type of imagery that works within those environments. We've also integrated the Mensuration Services Program. And what this allows you to do is once you bring that NITF imagery in, you can do some very advanced measurements, analytics, orthorectification, especially as we've adopted the community sensor model, we can work with a number of tactical sensors as well. So one of the things that, that we've done very well as an organization is develop the tools and the methods to bring multiple different types of intelligence imagery into the platform for exploitation. And this is the piece of software now that I'm most excited about. For those of you that have worked with ArcGIS in the past, uh, maybe you've tried to work with imagery in ArcMap, and perhaps that experience hasn't been your greatest. But with ArcGIS Pro, that totally changes. The user interface has been modified and is highly uh, suitable now towards the exploitation of imagery. Not only have we put all the imagery tools in uh, clearly identifiable locations so you can quickly find the tools that you need to. We've integrated things like fast roam and zoom, multiple screen displays, and the ability just to work with the imagery in a very quickly manner, produce your different reports and graphics that you want to produce, and then share those out to the broader community. With the GIS integration, it's highly suitable for doing not only phase one, but phase two, and of course phase three exploitation, where you really bring in the geospatial components into your exploitation. So this is a little bit of a closer look of the new uh, Pro Desktop. And one of the things we like to point out because it was, a, it was one of the weaknesses inside of ArcMap was that in the past, our system always defaulted to wanting to display imagery with north is up. And it would always try to fit it to some type of map projection. Well, that's now all changed we fully support what we call image coordinate space. So this allows you to bring in imagery from whatever source it might be, and then taking a look at the sensor metadata, we can automatically on the fly dynamically rotate that so up is up. So you're looking at the imagery the way the satellite took the imagery. This allows you to do a proper exploitation without looking at an image that's been distorted by reprojecting into a map projection system. The key thing though, is that we fully maintain the geospatial precision of the map projection that you've selected to, this, to work with, with the products that you're developing. So as you go in and you digitize features, you can overlay GIS layers, you can add annotations, whatever it might be, all that data maintains a very precise geospatial reference. So the nice thing is, is the next time you bring an image in, all that geographic information will display properly over it even if it's displayed in a totally different rotation according to image coordinate space. And of course, with MSP and our other mensuration tools, our ability to work with different sensor models, we've added a whole suite of different precision me measurement capabilities, uh, whether it be just the simple areas of things or actual 3D measurements where we're measuring the heights of building, the shadow heights, or areas in 3D different data sets. So it's very powerful that we can do these things and the, it, those are the types of tools that image analysts knew, need to have to do their basic job. So, but rather than have me talk about it, let's have Kyle give you a demonstration of these capabilities. Go ahead, Kyle. All right, thanks, Kurt. So, 
I'm going to show a typical imagery workflow over Iran using ArcGIS Pro and kind of highlight some of those capabilities that Kurt talked about to show you how Pro can be used as the all-in-one workstation for imagery. <clears throat> so using Pro, we're going to zoom into our area of interest, which is northwest of Karamabad. And when we do that, what we will find is a facility of interest that is hidden in the mountains. So I can look at my most recent NIDIF image, but if I really want to understand this, uh, what I want to do is look at this uh, look at this area at multiple images over time. So to do that, I can connect to our portal and search for additional image services. <clears throat> And I do that and I can, and I find four digital globe imagery plus analytic services, and they provide access to our historic and current collection of images. So using services, we no longer need to download terabytes of raw imagery. We just have access to that immediately. So once these services are added to the map, then we can click through the different images, starting with the oldest, moving to the next and the next, and we can even scroll to the most recent. 2D gives us one perspective of this area, so we can also add a 3D map to give us a different perspective. And we'll spin it around so we get a better look into the valley here. Now let's, uh, let's take a look at the perimeter of our, of our facility here in 2D. And doing that, we make our first observation. So this is a security fence. And if we follow it down here, we notice that there's a gap in the fence. However, if we look at this area in 3D, we can see that it's not a gap, but it's just an elevation change that we weren't able to notice in 2D. So let's look in 3D at the entrance to the facility here. So this is a Vericon I3S mech that we're looking at that gives us a beautiful realistic view of this area <clears throat> and looking at it we notice that there's a road that appears to be dead ending into the cliff here so let's analyze that in 2d with our current image service so if we focus here on the top of the cliff we see what looks like a circular hole you can measure that, it's about five meters wide. And then if we scroll through our images on November 30th, we see that the hole gets covered up. And then scrolling through more images almost a year later, we see another hole that appears to the south. And then if we look at our most recent pan sharpened image, we can definitely confirm that there's something hidden underneath the surface. So to dig deeper into that, we're gonna use a new capability that Kurt mentioned called the image space analysis. So this is an oblique image here and it's been orthorectified into map space. And by doing that, it becomes really difficult to discern uh, anything in this distorted image. But now ArcGIS Pro can seam seamlessly transform that map space into image space. So with just one click, I can now see the image at the angle that it was taken, which in this case is 180 degrees to the south and 44 degrees off Nader. So I'm going to do that one more time and show you. Those melted, distorted mountains with just one click now show the mountains as they really appear. So let's use this to take a closer look at our tunnel entrance. So we see on this day that there were clouds that got in the way. So we'll choose a different image to, to view it in image space. And with image space, we can now get a good look at that tunnel entrance. I'll adjust the brightness before I do any further analysis on it. And then I can come to my imagery tab and start to work with mensuration tools. So the mensuration tool uses spatial reference in the camera model for accurate measurements. So I can measure the width of the tunnel here. It tells me it's about eight meters wide. And I can also 
measure the height of this building next door using its shadow. So I can measure from the top of the building to the top of the shadow, and it's about three and a half meters. Now our image services support data from a variety of sensors that come from a variety of satellites. And if we switch to this GOI false color image here, it makes it easier to identify and explore a number of suspicious objects, such as these three vehicles that we see right here. So let's uh, take a look at these up close. And now it becomes a little more evident what we're looking at. It appears to be a missile that's sitting on top of a launch vehicle. So we can measure the dimensions of this vehicle. We see that it's about three meters by about 12 meters. And from this, we can infer its type, like a probable Shahab II. And understanding the dimensions of this vehicle and the entrance of the tunnel, we can assess that these vehicles could be stored underground here. So we're going to explore one more area. We'll zoom into this missile here that we see, and the characteristics are about 16 meters, which are consistent with a Shahab 3. Now, seeing multiple missiles exposed to the environment like this is an anomaly, so let's try to understand why that is. So we zoom out a little here and explore some of our previous images. We can see that there used to be a building here. But two months later, it looks like there's been a probable explosion and the building has been severely damaged. And looking at this in its worldview to false color image, the black around the building is indicative of a brush fire. So up to this point, you know, we've been able to identify a suspected underground facility. We've discern, discerned probable missiles. We've determined a likely reason for why they're out in the open. So now that we've discovered all of this information using Pro uh, to, to look at our imagery, we can now use Pro to begin to capture this information. So to do that, uh, we'll return to our 3D scene, and we're going to navigate to a building in the north part of the facility. And we'll spin it around so that we get a better view of, that, of this building. So we'll look at this building in 3D. We'll also add a window of this building in our image space, and we'll add a view of the building in our uh, 2D ortho map. And what I'll begin to do is start to capture these features in multiple windows. So in the 2D ortho map, I can capture the outline of the security fence around the building. And then in the image space, I can capture details about the building itself. And then in 3D, I can place the location of the anti-aircraft artillery gun. So what you saw there was digitizing in three separate windows where we were able to locate the features most easily. So let's take a look at all of the features now that we've captured about this facility. So looking at these documented features, if we select the outside fence, we can see that uh, that fence line doesn't go around the entire facility. How do we explain this? Well, let's take a look in 3D at our terrain analysis of the area. So by doing a slope calculation of this area, the outer fences appear to only be placed on the low sloped areas and the high sloped areas are providing natural protection. Now to confirm that hypothesis, we can use our built-in hydrology tools and we can calculate the watershed to clearly see that the fences are in place to complement 
the natural physical security. Now we've captured the position of three anti-aircraft artillery guns. So the last thing that we want to do here is use our new exploratory analysis tools to better understand what their coverage is. So using the view shed, what we can do is compute the visibility in real time according to the location of the anti-aircraft artillery guns. And the results of this are interactive. So I can see everything that these anti-aircraft guns see. And these tools are compatible with 3D layers such as the buildings that we've captured in the facility as well. So with that, that concludes our demo of ArcGIS Pro. So as you were able to see, we were able to discover uh, information about this area in our imagery, and we were able to capture that information and perform analysis on it. And we we can see that it's an area that's a it's a very secure underground facility that supports missile operations, and we should monitor continue to monitor this area closely. So with that, I will turn it back over to Kurt. Thanks, Kyle. Excellent demonstration. I think that clearly shows the power of ArcGIS Pro, if you haven't seen it before. Um, very clearly, Kyle stepped through a number of different uh, analysis workflows, uh, taking that from basic imagery exploitation all the way up to he was doing uh, some very advanced type of work with 3D and visualization. I'd now like to go in and discuss a little bit more about advanced geoint type capabilities. And this is probably one of uh, the most unique aspects with regards to ArcGIS and our imagery capabilities. So we build upon the visualization and exploitation tools that, that Kyle was showing and get a little bit deeper and start taking advantage of more raster analytics and some of the GIS functionality that naturally resides inside of ArcGIS. So taking a look at the data set that, that Kyle was showing uh, of Iran, uh, one of the things that I'd like to point out is, is all that data that he was showing was in the uh, unclassified version of NITF called NCDRD. And so it's very similar to uh, other types of sources that you might have available. And it very much proves the capability of our software's capability to work with NITF data and do exploitation against imagery that comes in the NITF format. So in this particular case, and one of the things that I wanted to show out that show out, show that Kyle was able to leverage was the fact that we can call up an image of a, of a target area, but then a lot of the improvements to that imagery can actually be embedded as raster functions. And these are simple tools that you can drag and drop directly into an image metadata file that essentially does dynamic pro processing on that image on the fly as it's being displayed uh, by the system. So in this particular case, this is an example of doing a, a, a contrast stretch dynamically on top of the image on the fly. So Kyle has put together, when he did that demo, he had actually built some of these raster analytics into the data sets. So whenever he calls them up and opens them up, it's automatically presented that way for him. So it's almost like you're able to embed tr uh, imagery tradecraft into the workflow by editing these function chains. Another key capability is that he was able to link this data set, the imagery that he was showing, up to a digital elevation model, a terrain file. And what's actually happening is he's displaying that in image coordinate space. The system is actually ortho rectifying that imagery on the fly in image coordinate space. And this is absolutely critical. Because what that means is every feature that he digitizes in there, uh, that he extracts and brings out and displays in his graphics, are extremely precise in 3D positions. And so as he brings in more and more different types of imagery into his exploitation pattern, all his overlays, all his features will fit directly on top of those images. What that allows us to do then, as an analyst, is to start implementing structured observation management techniques towards your exploitation. 
what limited SOM in the past was the fact that a lot of times the analysts would get an image, and on one image it was uh, oblique in one direction, depending on the look angle of the satellite, and then the next image it would be taken from a different look angle. And the problem is that as you did annotation on top of that target, that annotation for one image would not fit on top of the annotation for the other image. And so you really couldn't do a comparison from one to one because your annotation wasn't geospatially precise. Now that we've solved that problem, we can take advantage of the GIS capabilities inside of ArcGIS to put together a structured observation management template. It starts with ontology. And this is just an analysis of the particular target you're looking at. So such as an airfield where you have both static and mobile targets. You'll actually build up feature layers for all the different things like facilities and infrastructure. And then on the order of battle side, the aircraft, the support, this is the stuff that kind of moves around. But you can build up feature templates. And so when the analyst goes in to exploit a particular target, they'll just open those templates up. They'll digitize right on top of the imagery. But what's key is, the next time he gets an, imagery, uh, an image of that target, whatever he exploits using the structured observation uh, management method will overlay directly on top of that new image so he can see exactly what's changed since the last collect. So this is a very powerful component that, that, that ArcGIS brings to the entire imagery intelligence exploitation workflow. One of the things we also talked about was the ability to integrate all these different ends. So uh, representing SIGINT, ELINT information as overlays, whether those be ellipses or however you want to portray those, those all have a geospatial value to them. And those can be simply overlaid precisely on top of your imagery. And then you can do your target analysis, just like, tar just like Kyle was doing over Iran, and integrate those together. And then perhaps you might even have a third source, like uh, OPIR, Overhead Persistent Infrared, and be able to precisely monitor those. This is giving you all the information that you need about the target, and you can use a single platform to develop that intelligence and share that information out to different organizations. I talked a little bit about those raster functions, and unfortunately we don't have time to get into much detail, but what's, what's very cool about these things is that they actually can be set up to work as chains. So perhaps you want to put an image enhancement technique next to a change detection technique to improve the quality of your change detection. You can just drag and drop both of these things into a single viewer and build this simple model, and you essentially have embedded tradecraft to be able to do those exploitation. What's nice is that your, your, your imagery experts that know how to set up and run these, these very simple types of processes, can actually build and embed this tradecraft into the models, and then analysts down the road can use those in their own analysis without having to reinvent the wheel or go through all the different processes and steps. They just drag and drop them and apply them to their own imagery. The other thing where Esri is working very closely on is imagery analytics with artificial intelligence. We've had some capabilities um, in earlier releases of the software. One of the things that, that we added a, a few years ago was a support vector machine classifier capability. This was using machine language to go in and work with imagery to do classification against an image segment to pull out different types of features. We're now running even further with those machine learning type processes. And you'll see this at our user conference if you're going to attend. And Subsequently, as we roll out these capabilities, you'll start to see them more and more as part of being our mainstream uh, feature extraction, raster analytics, and more detailed analysis of your data set. So we're very excited about where we're going as far as artificial intelligence goes with inside the ArcGIS platform. One of the most recent things we've done inside of uh, the ArcGIS Pro tools. It started with, with version 2.1 and now is fully up and working inside of version 2.2 is our high precision photogrammetry. We can now pull in imagery from satellites, aircraft, drones. We can do the collection, bring that in, assign ground control points to it, and we can, act, can actually do a triangulated block bundle adjustment to ensure that the imagery that 
results from this type of process is extremely accurate. Because this is a full up photogrammetric capability, not only can we make the orthophotos, but we can produce the digital surface models, the DEMs, and now even the point clouds using the stereo overlap of your images that you run through this process. What's more, this can either work in your desktop solution, or we can also push this analysis into our server technology and distribute that processing across multiple CPUs. So if you're doing a significant amount of production work, you can push this entire photogrammetric workflow into the cloud, and you can then process hundreds, if not thousands of images in a, in a time frame that, that meets mission requirements. These are just some of the products that the photogrammetric capability is now able to produce, whether it be ortho photos for base mapping, generating contours from the elevation. We can do these very detailed site modeling where we put together meshes and build 3D models. And then of course, those can all plug into more analytical tools or, or visualization tools for surveillance type things, whether it be change detection, 3D measure, inspection viewers, as you will. So it's very exciting on where we're going with being able to produce very precise imagery. And of course, now we've added a stereo capability as well. This works right now in ArcGIS Pro, and it works with both Anaglyph and the very fancy shutter glasses. So you can bring in a stereo pair, you can do full up 3D feature extraction, and then what's more is that all the Arc Edit tools are available in stereo mode. So as you collect your features, you can build these very nice 3D models that are stored as a feature service and are ready to go inside of any GIS. I also mentioned uh, that we support point clouds. As we're starting to see more and more tactical applications for, for point cloud collectors, this has become a very important tool. So it's not only visualization and display, but we can actually go in and start extracting out buildings and, and natural features. We can build very precise train models. And then those train models can plug into a variety of different GIS capabilities like cross-country mobility, helicopter landing zone, those types of things. So we now have the ability to do very close to near real-time train analysis, both with our imagery and our precision elevation products, all in a single solution. And then finally, one of the most recent advances that we've just added to ArcGIS Pro 2.2 is our ability to work with full motion video. So as imagery comes in off of a drone, we can do true real-time exploitation of that data. But rather than talk about it, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Kyle, and he's gonna give a demonstration of these capabilities. All right. <clears throat> Thanks, Kurt. Yeah, when Kurt says it's recent, he's not kidding. This uh, this capability was just released uh, a couple days ago. So we're looking at imagery over Cheyenne, Wyoming, and uh, what we do is we focus in on an oil refinery in this area, and we use it to demonstrate uh, a compound observation and monitoring scenario. So over this area, we have we have some drone footage that we want to analyze. And now with the full motion video capability in ArcGIS Pro 2.2, with the image analyst extension, videos are now natively supported. And those can be uh, real-time streaming videos or recordings. So when we add this video to the map, Pro, reads the metadata within the video file to make that video geospatially aware. And we see, we can see the field of view on the map, as well as the platform position and path. Now I can use a variety of, there are a variety of widgets that make navigation easier. So I can change the color of the field of view area and the platform on the map. And I can also use these widgets to switch between the video area or just the field of view itself. And I can even have the video followed as it moves throughout the map. I can pause the video itself. 
I can use steps to skip forward or backwards, or I can scroll to the most important parts of the video. And I can even use widgets to export the video frame as an image on the map itself with just one simple click. And then any observations that I make in the video itself, I can add graphics to those observations in the video, and you'll see that they appear on the map themselves. So these are great features, simple, very powerful for helping incorporate uh, video footage into your map projects. Now, one of the advantages of having FMV capabilities in ArcGIS Pro is that not only can you work with this in a map, but you can work with it in a 3D scene as well. So FMV also captures the altitude of the platform so that when you run a video in 3D, you get a much better visualization of the platform location in regards to the field of view. So as this video here follows the truck and I drop breadcrumbs of the truck's location, I can also follow the position of the drone as well. So that concludes a very simple but uh, powerful capability of FMV. So with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Kurt. Thanks, Kyle. Moving on, let's go ahead and talk about imagery intelligence as a service. And this might be confusing to some people, but I'm gonna go ahead and, and step you through it because I think it's some very exciting technology that's really changing the way uh, imagery intelligence and exploitation is going to be done. I think we're all used to desktop exploitation. We have a, a software tool that we use on our computer to do our work. And some of you have even moved up to the point where you have different file servers, you're accessing your imagery. Perhaps you download, bring that imagery to your local system, and then you do your exploitation that way. But as this technology has evolved, what we're really starting to see is the implementation of, of clouds and services, especially imagery services. And this is an area that we focused as a company on very heavily. And what this allows you to do is actually, once you, when you start realizing the potential of this, is that you can have these infrastructures and you can have libraries, massive archives of both imagery and feature data and be able to access that via web services. But then in turn, you can share that within a system of systems that allows organizations to work together to share information. So you can have your SIGIN analysts doing their work and your imagery analysts doing their work and bring them all together in a common system to present that, that information that really helps drive the intelligence cycle to produce the products that you need. And so the ArcGIS platform is designed to fully support that, especially in terms with regards to imagery. And the way we're doing that is with a new product that came out with version 10.5 called the Image Server. In the past, imagery services were part of an extension for the ArcGIS server. But that wasn't ideal because it didn't allow you to properly scale the requirements that you needed. Now that the Image Server is separate, you can actually scale that up to meet your mission requirements based on how much imagery you're working with and what type of raster analytics that you want to do. So what this is capable of doing then is accessing massive archives of imagery, but not only just serving up the pixels that you need to exploit in your different exploitation clients, but it can also be used to run the raster analytics. So if you want to push your ortho rectification, if you want to push your uh, feature extraction, your segmentation. If you want to do AI type work, you can push this all up to the server and have the process be distributed across multiple CPUs with multiple cores for some very advanced processing. So it's fully type scale. What's also critical is, is the whole portal implementation. 
It's through Portal that you access all this information and that you run these services. And Portal can be accessed via ArcGIS Pro, like Kyle's been doing in the demos that we're doing. But we're also starting to develop a whole family of thin client exploitation tools that take full advantage of this configuration. One of the things that we've done to the ArcGIS image server is we put a layer on top of that that we're now calling NIGHT, the National Imagery Technology Extension for the image server. This gives you the full ability to work with and serve up uh, NTM imagery and NCDRD that's in the NITF format. Because we've integrated MSP as part of this, you can actually do precision mensuration and ortho photogrammetry in a thin client web-based tool. So it's very powerful as we move towards these more advanced ways of working with imagery. The other thing that the image server is designed to do is rather than download the entire image with every single pixel with all the different resolution data sets, the server is designed to only display the pixels that that client wants to look at at that given time. So no matter how much you zoom in, you zoom out or roam around the image, you're just pulling down from the server the pixels that you want to exploit. So your roam rates, your zoom rates, your exploitation tools work almost as fast as if that imagery was there local on your own system. The other thing you can do by setting up this, this imagery type structure is build in very um, advanced search and discovery tools for your imagery data sets. And so this has been a very powerful way to go in and quickly find the imagery that you want to exploit and then the system just dynamically pulls in the pixels from your area of interest so you can do that exploitation. And you can set up standing queries, and those queries can be built on top of, you know, metadata from the satellites, the, the cloud coverage of the target area, uh, the look angle of the satellite, whatever it might be. Those can be all set up as standing queries, and it will automatically deliver those systems to your exploitation client. And then we built a number of widgets. And these are imagery exploitation widgets that work with uh, the web app builder to go ahead and start putting together your own thin clients to do some very precise image processing type capabilities, whether it be histogram adjustment, change detection, swipe tools, those types of things. These are all widgets that you just drag and drop into a web app. And then we're taking this even one step further. Uh, we're going to be showing at the UC our, our newest web ELT product called Excalibur for ArcGIS. It's a fantastic capability. It's a thin client exploitation tool designed for the image analyst in mind. It fully takes advantage of the Knight server, being able to work with NTM, NITF, and NCRD imagery, along with the sensor models. It has that precision search capability and the, the ability to set up standing queries and shoe boxes that allow you to quickly discover the imagery for your exploitation area and start doing the analysis. One of the things that the server is also very much aware of is image coordinate space. So it can serve out that imagery to that thin client, either as a map projected image or serve it out in image coordinate space. So you can actually exploit the imagery the way the satellite took the picture. This is all operating in a thin client. We have the tools to do different types of stretch and convolution filtering to improve the quality of the imagery. And of course, because MSP is part of this program, we can do the very precise mensuration required for, RA, for, different, for IAs within the community. One of the very nice features that we're continuing to develop is a task-based approach to setting up workflows for analysts. So they just simply click on a task and there's a set of workflows that they just follow along and do their exploitation. And then because of that image coordinate space, no matter how we do the graphics, uh, the feature layers, the GIS layers, it will project properly, whether it's in map space or in image coordinate space. And then in turn, we can, as we annotate and we do those graphics, we can produce those products and distribute them in an enterprise fashion. So we're very excited about Excalibur for ArcGIS. It's going to be coming out in beta at the UC. And so we're very excited to be able to start showing the capabilities of this tool. So now Kyle's going to give a demonstration. Unfortunately, um, we weren't allowed yet to show off the full capabilities of Excalibur, 
Uh, but Kyle's going to show similar web services and a prototype application that shows you how uh, web exploitation can be done. All right, thanks, Kurt. <clears throat> Yeah, so this was a web app that was specifically created for an incident that occurred at the Tripoli airport in Libya of July 2014. So the airport was attacked during the Civil War, and so the app was designed to record observations in the post-attack imagery in a web browser. So this web app is consuming pre- and post-attack imagery. And if I can uh, come here to the swipe tool, uh, I can compare the differences in the two images this way. I can also come to the layer list and simply uh, turn off the pre-attack image <coughs> and focus just on the post-attack imagery. And then I can also turn on the additional layers uh, showing different observations that have already been made, such as fires, uh, debris for cleanup, and then damage planes and buildings as well. And so as I pan through this image myself and make my own observations, uh, I can move to the edit tab and record those different observations. Uh, like an unrecorded fire here, and I can ID that, or I can pan over to a, an unreported damaged building, And I can draw that out as well and ID it as well. So I can also zoom to different bookmarks, showing important areas around the airport. And if I find an area of interest, I can even create and add my own bookmark as well. And I can also come here and add additional data from my portal from a URL or from a file to give additional context to this map. And I can even perform measurements on the features in the area, such as the plane, or I can measure area as well. and choose from a variety of units of measurement. So that's our Image Observables app for Libya. And with that, I'm going to conclude and turn it over to Wendy. Thanks, Kyle. Today you've seen how ArcGIS Pro is the foundation for a complete imagery workstation. Analysts can leverage web and image services and manage phased exploitation within ArcGIS Pro. Without leaving the workstation environment, analysts can incorporate structured observation management workflows and analysis and add FMV directly to an ArcGIS Pro project. With thin client imagery tools, analysts can bring in national imagery and conduct analysis with tools available in configurable widgets. I hope you enjoyed this webinar. If you are interested in learning more about ArcGIS Pro or the intelligence configuration for ArcGIS Pro, you can view the recordings of previous webinars within this series. Stay connected with our defense and intelligence community on GeoNet at community.esri.com under Industries for Defense and Intelligence. Here you can ask technical questions, read customer success stories, view user-created story maps, and find additional information on products or solutions. We also offer a series of regional technical exchange meetings. Some of those offer hands-on exercises and training. You can register at go.esri.com slash DI series. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Richard to take your questions. Thank you, everyone. <clears throat> now we'd like to give you the opportunity to get your specific questions answered. Please use the questions tabs on your right and type in your questions and we will answer them here, live. So yeah, the first question we have is, will image analysts for ArcGIS Pro be available through Esri ELAs? 
So I can take that one. The short answer of that is 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 absolutely yes. Um, it's going to be made available, and it's it it's it's actually part of the price list right now. So I think uh, that's going to be available and uh, can be requested by different users around the community. Perfect. Thank you. Another one we have is: Does this replace remote view for menstruation? <laughs> Uh, you know, remote view um, is a fantastic imagery exploitation product. It's probably one of the best out there. One of the things that we can say, though, is that because we take full advantage of MSP and the MSP program, um, that is the approved way to do true mensuration, true measurement. And so the results that you'll get off our exploitation tools are the exact same as you'll get off re remote view as you do that type of, of analysis and measurement. Alrighty, uh, how does this analysis compare to Quick Terrain Modeler? Modeler. Uh, the QT Modeler, with regards to being able to extract um, different types of features, I assume off point clouds and lidar data. So, you know, our our lidar capabilities have continued to improve over the past couple of releases of the software. Uh, we now can actually calculate bearer stems. We can calculate vegetation. We can do uh, building extractions, feature extractions. So it's it's a very powerful solution. And of course, we've always had the GIS side of things, where we can take that foundation data, whether it be you know very detailed digital surface models and buildings. We can actually build a whole host of different products against that using the GIS powers of our you know of ArcGIS, whether it be cross country mobility, helicopter landing zones, those types of things. So I, I haven't used QT Modeler extensively, um, but I'm very confident that those that are doing advanced geo -in terrain type of analysis, uh, that you'll be able to take advantage of LIDAR now inside of ArcGIS to do a whole variety of very detailed terrain analysis products. All right, thank you for that. Another one we have here is, is there a particular video format for the uh, FMB to be supported in Arc? Pro? That's a great question. Um, we kind of prefer to have, uh, you know, video feeds that come in with, with the MISB compliance within it, just because that gives us that precision geospatial information uh, that allows us to work very closely within our geospatial framework. But it's not required. Uh, one of the things that we've done in the recent version of the software is add something called the multiplexer. And with that tool, users can actually go in and look at the different parameters of the sensor that took the imagery and the sensor that actually flew it. And they can actually add their own geospatial content in there that allows you to actually map out where those image frames reside. It potentially won't be as accurate as what you get if you have a true MISB feed with you know, advanced uh, information hooked up to the GPS capabilities on board the particular sensor that took it but um, you know with the right inputs you can get very good results all righty another one is um, is fmv created like a timeline is it like using web-based story maps Ooh, i don't know kyle i mean you can definitely thumb through it you can slide through the different images you can uh you can set up different bookmarks and catalogs. Kyle, did you? Yeah, have I would. You to I would compare it more to like a time slider. Uh, yeah, I mean, so yeah, you. There's a variety of ways that you can scroll through the video. You can you can click through different steps, and yeah, like Kurt was saying, you can create different bookmarks based on uh, certain certain spots in the video and as you click on those bookmarks the video will jump to that spot as well uh, so there's just a lot there are a lot of options for getting to the point in time in the video that you need to yeah i think uh, one of the cool features if i remember kyle was that you can actually set up a, a geospatial coordinate and rather than sit there and watch through the whole video or thumb through it you say whenever the video crosses this 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 area of interest within this you know this geofence just automatically go to that portion in the video to to play it if i remember correctly yeah perfect thank you for that another one we have here is 
does the training for these tools exist now or are they coming soon? So we're building a bunch of different different types of training product prod, products that we can share out with people. Our goal now is to put together these, these two minute videos where we kind of step people through different, um, you know, workflows within the software, some basic ones, but they all build up to doing some more advanced type things. But yes, uh, we're starting to add more training into our program. Um, and, and you'll see those as we release them. Perfect. Thank you for that. And what we have here is um, SOM. It appears this functionality can be used to classify objects, for example, an aircraft or a blog or a building. Is this the workflow? Is this workflow the same with typical classification? Yeah, so we've started to build a, upon typical classifications. You know, in the old days, it was Landsat. It was true spectral approach where you'd use pixel-based classifiers. Now with our segmentation tools, it's, it's kind of all about uh, object-oriented classification. So we can actually go through, segment the image. We can determine the roundness and squareness of objects and use that to help drive our support vector machine classifier. So it's getting away from the traditional spectral-based, pixel-based classification tools that we used to use with Landsat. And these new classification tools are much more suitable to high resolution. If you have minimal number of bands, let's say you only have, you know, four bands, you know, true color with a with a near infrared, you can get really good decent results with the segmenter and our different classification tools, support vector machine um, type type work. The thing that's very exciting is where we're starting to go with AI tools, whether it's stuff that we are developing or stuff that we've done with our partners. Um, we're going to see some very highly automated feature extraction capabilities coming out in the next year or two. We've already started to put a framework in place to, to take advantage of things like TensorFlow, to quickly train these systems to identify particular IP types of objects so once you get that training done the ai tools then can quickly take a look at any new imagery that comes in and see and identify where those particular targets and features might be uh, so we're starting to work on that 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 very closely and we're very excited about where this is going in the future so oh yes we've gone beyond traditional classifiers uh, but the future is wide open on where we're going with ai so one last question here what is a practical limit for images and file storage? Oh, so let's take a, you know, this gets back to the whole server capability. We have customers that, ha we have one customer that is managing 27 petabytes of imagery uh, using our image server and imagery management tools. So that includes all the metadata, the pixels, et cetera. The thing that allows us to do this is that we, we don't store the pixels as part of the database, if you will. Um, we actually just build something called a mosaic data set, which serves as somewhat of a pointer to where the pixels reside, but we manage all the metadata. And then once again, the server then can take a look at all that information and make logical choices as to how to display that imagery back to the client when the request is made. So theoretically, there's no limit on how much imagery that we can manage um, with our server technology. And like I said, um, we have some clients that are managing enormous amounts of imagery with our server technology. Thank you. I actually got one more in here. Um, okay. In here are are there plans to integrate these new tools with MTI slash GMT workflows and a standard data framework for those workflows? Well, I think that, you know, uh, right now we don't have specific NTI extraction capabilities, but you got other systems that provide that information. So once again, it gets back to the science aware and the, you know, the foundation of location. So as, as those are pulled out by different sensors, we in turn can display that information as just GIS overlays on our screen. Um, we are working with partners to bring in more of an advanced um, uh, SAR image processing capability to take full advantage of, of radar, uh, but we don't have significant radar capabilities within our software at this time. 
All right, thank you. Uh, that's all we have time for today. Thank you again, everyone, for attending. Please do take a few minutes to complete the survey that will appear when you exit.